This happened in June 2018 in Portland, Oregon. I understand I acted like an idiot in this situation. Since then, I've become more observant, cautious, and honestly, much more paranoid. I went dancing with friends and was really drunk by midnight. Unfortunately, this was back when I had little money, and I realized you could save money by eating very little before going out, and it would take far fewer drinks to get drunk. So I was so drunk that I barely remember my friend ordering me an Uber home. My phone was dead, of course. I can vaguely recall them helping me into the car and telling me to get home safe. I don't remember greeting the driver or the first minute or so. But soon after getting in, he asked how my night was going and if I smoked. Honestly, I was just thinking about bed at this point. So I sort of just flirted out that I did sometimes. He then offered me a joint. And this is the first moment I got sort of nervous and began paying attention. So I tell him something like, I'm really tired and just ready to get home. I think he said something about it being an indica based joint and it made for great sleep. Once again, I say something, not exactly no, but not a yes, which he takes as a yes, take that joint now. Once again, I'm still drunk enough, I can barely see straight or speak clearly. So when he says, okay, we'll have to cancel the ride really quickly because I can't give it to you while I'm on the clock, or something to that effect. It takes me a second to realize how dangerous that is. And by the time I start to say something, he has cancelled the ride and pulls over. We were just east of the Halloween Bridge, I think, and it was totally secluded. Some empty parking lots, a closed auto body shop, no one in sight. It's starting to hit me, I'm now in the car not with an Uber driver, but with some stranger. I can't call anyone, and he's trying to give me weed that could have anything in it. For the next minute or so, were pretty quiet, or I just can't remember any small talk he tried to make because I was beginning to panic, and every time he handed me the joint, I would take fake hits, just breathing it into my mouth and not into my lungs. I felt tired, clumsy, and weak, that kind of drunk where you're almost at the point of nausea, and I knew I couldn't do much of anything to defend myself at that point. I remember vividly being fixated for a moment on the fact I didn't have a pair of keys to defend myself with, as my building used fobs for just about everything, and I didn't take my mail key with me. As I'm freaking out, I look up to see if this guy is sort of noticing, and I make eye contact with him in the mirror. He was staring at me, but I couldn't read his expression. Finally, he says something along the lines of, well, let's get out of here. I tell him I'll just call another Uber to get home, thinking at this point it might even be safer to walk. And he says, No, I still have your address. I'll just take you home. For a moment, I was relieved. I guess I wanted to believe him so badly that I would get home safe that I believed him. So I tried to calm myself down, thinking he hadn't actually done anything threatening. Maybe he was just your typical stoner guy, and I'm overreacting. At this time, I lived on PSU campus in downtown Portland, in the southwest area of the city. He is driving me north on the east side of the river. There are several bridges to our left, and as he keeps moving north, he has several opportunities to take an exit to hop over the river and get me back to downtown. He keeps skipping them. We keep passing bridge after bridge that could get me home. Up in northeast Portland, there are several large industrial areas that can get very isolated at night, and Portland in general is surrounded by lots of forests, so I knew he could have me in a secluded area really quickly. After he passes like the fourth exit for a bridge, pretty sure it was the Broadway Bridge, I've been racking my brain for a way to make him actually take me home, and so I say something to the effect of, Hey, my boyfriend is waiting for me at home, which was true though I said it in a very meek way. My driver says nothing, but he did take the next exit for a bridge and basically hung a giant U-turn that started taking me home, even as we're on the west side of town heading south. I'm still shaking and have my hand on the door handle, 
Thinking about just hopping out at a red light the closer we got to my apartment, my phone is completely dead, and he honestly still has several chances to hop onto nearby highways and speed out of the city. We're getting pretty close to my apartment now, and I'm once again trying to convince myself I'm being paranoid about some stoner that can't navigate the city, although a few minutes before I was so scared that I was crying. So once we get about two blocks from my apartment, I lie and tell him it's easiest to stop here and he can let me out. Again, he doesn't say anything, but does slow the car. I'm flooded with relief and even feel myself smile, but when I go to open the door, it's locked. I try to lift the lock mechanism manually, but it won't budge. So I look up at him instinctually to see what's going on, and he's got his head turned almost fully toward me, shoulder still facing the road, smiling at me. This was the worst smile I've ever seen in my life. It looked so mocking and it just did not reach his eyes at all. I just started crying and asking him to open the door. I was so freaked out and still very drunk, and thank God that he did. I will never forget the sensation of vulnerability, not just being drunk in his car with no way to contact anyone, but even as I got out of the car, I kept feeling like he would somehow grab the back of my t-shirt and pull me back in, as silly as that sounds. When I got home, I found out my boyfriend had actually gone out with friends last minute and wasn't even home. He wouldn't even have known till much later if I hadn't got him back safe. The next day, I convinced myself I was freaking out over nothing, which I realized still could be the case, but in my gut I had truly felt in danger the night before. Now, technically, this guy could have been totally harmless, but I still think I should have texted my friend and had her report him. The big thing that made me think of this was recently hearing about how Ed Kemper, co-ed killer, would go for practice runs, picking up hitchhikers and seeing if he could get the passengers slash potential victims to trust him or how far out of his comfort zone he could push them without them saying anything. Obviously, this guy wasn't Ed Kemper, but I hate wondering if that night was a practice run of sorts for my Uber driver. Thanks to whoever reads this whole thing through, I'm at a point in my life where I'm realizing how much danger I put myself in when I was younger, and I'm just depressed as hell as it has made me both surprised and deeply grateful I'm still here. This happened when I was about 14 to 15 years old. I'm 19 years old now. I was in my house's basement playing PlayStation absent-mindedly late into the night. This was something I did quite often at this time. Being up until 3 to 4 a.m. was not unusual for me. How my house is structured is it has a front door, but also has a second set of front doors if you're down the driveway. The basement is by these second doors. As I was getting ready to log off for the night, I heard my dog start going crazy from upstairs. They sometimes bark at nothing, a car passing in the night or too much wind whipping past their window. However, as someone who listened to too many scary stories, that was more than enough for me. I went up the stairs and was about to go straight to my room and this is when I caught a glimpse of movement out of a window. I looked through the window to my front yard, but I couldn't really see anything. Suddenly then, I heard my dad yell in a voice lower than his own. Hey, can I help you? This is what set me into pure adrenaline mode. I stood frozen staring out the window as my eyes strained to hear the guy's response. I still got nothing, before my dad continued. Sorry. But you have the wrong house. Get off the property. Here he comes back into sightline. A man wearing a white sleeveless shirt and cargo pants. I watched as he walked off our front path and onto the street, and then back onto the path. He was seemingly unsure of where to go and what to do. It was now I realized with utter dread I didn't lock the downstairs front door. I finally break my frozen spell and run back down the stairs and lock the front door. I then take a deep breath and start back towards the stairs, and this is when I hear it. The door handle is jiggling. I don't even look back. 
I book it to the top of the stairs and to my parents' room. My dad at this point had already called the cops. They came, and about a half hour later, they seemingly picked up a man from an empty house down the street that was in the process of being sold. The following day, the newspaper told of an escaped convict from the max security prison here. Some sort of mix-up was made, and they let the wrong person out. They caught him, luckily enough, but didn't detail where. And that is how I both forgot and remembered my way through a creepy encounter. So, a little bit of backstory. I'm a 34-year young mom of two. I am also an assistant catering manager at a prestigious boarding school, and as such I work shifts. They are either early or late, with a weekend on before I get a day off. So a 12-day cycle, but I digress. In about November of 2019, I was working morning shift, so I was up and out at the house by 5.45 a.m., I had to put some diesel in my car so I made my way to the closest petrol station. I go there quite frequently so I know the attendants pretty well. We have petrol attendants in my country as you do not fill up your own cars. So as tired as we all were, we had a chat while waiting for the car to fill. I'm the only car there and since it's summer, it's pretty light out at this point. Another car pulls up. Americans call them trucks. We call them 4x4 backies. This was a fairly new model. After their car was filled, I noticed the driver, a well-dressed, clean, middle-aged man, had gotten out and was rummaging under the passenger seat. He seemed agitated, and I was just minding my own damn business, but was obviously watching him, as hello, I'm alone and bored waiting for my car to fill up. This stranger looks me dead in the eyes, and I swear to you he looked vacant like he was there physically, but his brain was not in the now. He then proceeds to stop scratching around for whatever he was looking for. I assumed at the time it was his wallet, and jumps back into the driver's seat. Me thinking he has done the decent human thing and is paid, notices that he starts reversing quite fast out to the petrol station, and this is when I hear the attendant shouting at him that he hasn't paid. The man hoots his horn twice, as in, Oh crap, my bad, I'm coming to rectify my mistake and sort this out, kind of way. So the attendant is approaching his car to finish the transaction. Well, this piece of crap then proceeds to try and run over the attendant, like as his wheels are skidding, smoke from the tires type of aggressive driving, and he almost succeeded. He is smiling the whole time and I'm just there in shock, like I'm not naive and I know this stuff happens. But as cliche as it sounds, never in this small retirement town have I seen this. Myself and the attendants are just stumped, as in what the hell dude? We had a little chat about cameras, and if everyone was okay, and basically the whole absurdity and strangeness about this encounter. Anywho, off to work I go and ponder about this incident for about a week, until of course, I travel about 90 kilometers a day to and from work. I need to fill up my car again. I see the same attendant who was helping me today from the day of the incident. I start chatting with him, and the conversation went something like this. Me. Hey, do you remember the other day with that guy who drove off without paying? Attendant. Yeah, that was hectic. Me. Yeah, I know, right? So, did they catch him? Were you guys able to track him down with the cameras? Attendant. Yeah, they caught him in X town. Didn't you hear? Me. Hear what? Attendant. He had just shot some people at his workplace. His business partner, I think, and was going out with a blaze of glory. He had shot two more people when the police had caught up to him. Me. I'm sorry, what? Attendant. Yeah, and when they arrested him, he told the officers that he was trying to get his gun out to kill all of us. Me and the three attendants. When he stole the petrol, but couldn't find the bullets for his gun. It was one or the other. Guess what, folks? This guy had a stupid amount of bullets and more guns in the back of his backy. He intended to kill us. All of us. He wouldn't have been reported to the police as early as he was if he had succeeded. He planned to kill as many people as possible before getting caught. I still think about this all the time. 
and I thank God every day that this guy couldn't find his gun, and that by some miracle, he decided to rather try and kill by car than to open up the back and gun us all down. I am also grateful that he didn't hurt any of the attendants, they were just doing their job. So this is my scary story. I have plenty of strange and scary stories from my life if you want them. I mean, on a side note, I used to get premonitions and would also know when I woke up if someone I knew died. My granddad was a medium and he apparently gave me the gift that kept on giving. Anyway, TLDR went to put in petrol. Another driver drove off without paying, tried to run over the attendant. His intention was to kill us all with his gun, but he couldn't find it. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. When I was in college, I was out and about with my then boyfriend. We had gone to dinner and then went to Walmart to get some typical college food. That way we could survive a Sunday in. I was dressed up in a casual dressy fit. We decided to split up while we shopped split apart, maybe to do quicker shopping, but I don't remember the exact reason why. I was wandering the grocery aisles when I noticed this girl who was about my age. In a friendly manner, we casually exchanged smiles at each other and we continued on shopping. It didn't seem weird at first, but I kept noticing her in the same aisles as me and a big muscular man was never far behind us. Eventually, I texted my boyfriend and asked where he was, and continued on shopping. Next thing I know, the girl approaches me and says how she loves my jacket. I then say thank you and try to move on. She stops me and says something along the lines of, Hey, you look like you're my age, and you seem really nice. I just moved here for a new job and company my friends and I are starting. And then she tried to ask me questions about where I was from. I was vague and untrusting with what I said, noticing this isn't normal. And then she said, I'm looking for more people like you and I to work for our company. It's kind of a warehouse job, and I would love for you to be one of our bookkeepers. You should give me your number. I said, that is so nice of you to offer me a job, but I'm not a desk person, and I already have a job I love. She then said, that's a bummer. I thought we might work well together. Well, would you want to give me your number so we can hang out? I would love to have a friend who can show me around the city. I realized that I wasn't getting out of the situation until my boyfriend showed up or I gave her my number. Eventually, I ratted off a fake phone number and said, Hey, I'll catch you later. I gotta go. Then I walked away, praying my boyfriend would be near so we can get out of there. While I was looking for him and trying to call him, the girl caught up to me and said, I tried to call you, but it said the number was out of service. And as I tried to come up with a quick excuse and say, maybe you typed it in wrong, she saw that my iPhone was unlocked in my hand. She quickly snatched it and called herself on it. I was so flustered and mad at her that I snatched my phone back right away. And this is when my boyfriend came around the corner. He instantly recognized that something was up and said that we needed to go. When the girl saw him approach me, she looked so disappointed to see him and stopped trying to interact. We ended up buying nothing and leaving. That night we called our parents and the police. The police said they didn't think it was anything ill intended, but I was sure it was probably trafficking. I was going to switch my phone number because I was so scared. I blocked them and turned off all location access on my phone. I was too scared to go anywhere alone for a while. I even told my coach so she knew. A couple of days later, I got a text from a random phone number. It turned out to be the girl. She sent a picture of my best friend who was out drinking downtown with some of her other friends. The text said, I met your best friend. She gave me your number because I told her I was looking for new friends. She showed me a picture of you and I said, what a coincidence. 
I met her the other day and lost her number when I got a new phone. About two minutes later, I got a text from my best friend that said, I gave your number to a girl who wants to make friends around here and is looking for people to join her business. And since I moved this week, I thought of you. I freaked out she was with her and told her to get away and not leave alone with her. I stayed up worried until my best friend got home. She said she was fine, otherwise I would have gone to pick her up. The next day my best friend apologized and told me to block the number. My friend and her group tried to ditch her, but she kept showing up at the bars they were at. She said the girl was relentless and texted her all night trying to get my friend to go hang out at her place. My best friend also said that when she asked about the business, the girl wouldn't give her many details, other than that it was a warehouse somewhere, would pay her great, in town, and if she wanted a tour of it, she would take her. We never heard from this girl again. Today I was listening to a podcast, and they mentioned different sex trafficking tactics. Two were vague jobs. This is where they would pay you well but you needed to come meet them to give you more information. There was also a new-to-town girl who desperately needed new friends. I've been thinking about this all morning, and I'm glad I felt uncomfortable and my friend didn't go with this girl, but I'm mostly mad the cops ignored my concern and said that it was nothing. I just hope they wrote down that tip that night, but I highly doubt that. When I was about 10 years old, a really big storm went through the northeast corner of my state. It was about 4 p.m., and I was practicing with a community children's choir, an after-school program that I actually really enjoyed. We were practicing for a performance tour to all the nursing homes in town. I sung in the soprano section, and we were receiving some criticism from our director when someone's mom showed up 30 minutes early to pick them up. Then another mom showed up, and then someone's grandpa, and another kid's dad. One by one, everyone left early, and then my mom showed up. She seemed really worried and told me to hurry up and get in the car, so I grabbed my backpack and went out the door. When I walked outside, everything was dark. It was like the sun went down at 4.30pm after spring forward. That just didn't happen. Apparently, it stormed so badly in the hour I was at choir practice that parts of our town had flooded. There was hail so big it busted car windows and damaged homes. The ride home was pretty scary for me at that age. I had no idea why I was picked up so early. When we turned onto my street, it was flooded. The neighbors were rowing a canoe from one end to the other, and the older kids were trying to ride their bikes through the muddy flood water. We pulled into the driveway, and I immediately went inside and put my backpack in my room. My dad was in my room cleaning up glass off the floor and my bed. There was water all over the floor, and my bed was soaked on one side. He said the hell busted my bedroom window, and the rain poured into my room, and the hell melted on the floor and on my bed. My dad wasn't able to replace the window that evening, so we got a plastic tarp, the kind you use to cover furniture when you're painting and folded it into four layers and attached it to my window with a staple gun. We had a movie night and just spent time together as a family that night. It made me feel better about sleeping in my room, but I still wanted a light on. It took me a while to fall asleep, but I read a chapter of Little House on the Prairie. I was a weird kid, and that helped me fall asleep. That night I had a dream, at least I thought it was a dream. I heard a weird shuffling sound outside my window, like the sound of a window sliding open and shut, open, and then shut again. I realized I wasn't dreaming, but I couldn't move. My eyes were wide open, but it was like I was still asleep. I tried moving my legs, raising my arms, even tried rolling off the bed, but my body was stuck. Finally, I just used my voice. I mustered enough strength to scream as loud as I could. I managed to turn my head toward the window. All I saw were two hands with white gloves holding the wood frame of the window and moving it up and down trying to jimmy it open. When I screamed for a second time, it was gone. I jumped out of my bed and started to run to my parents' bedroom, but my legs felt like bricks and it felt like it took forever to get there. When I was outside of their door, 
I just screamed at my mom that someone was at my window. Fear and panic overwhelmed me as tears started dripping down my cheeks. My dad went outside to investigate and didn't see anyone, and I never knew why they didn't call the police right then. I ended up sleeping in my mom's bed with her, and my dad slept on the couch very close to my bedroom. The next morning, my dad walked around the house, and there were large muddy footprints from the street to my window and back again. The screen to my window was ripped off and tossed into the neighbor's yard. The plastic on my window had a large hole the size of a man's finger, which was right above the window lock. Needless to say, my parents did finally call the police. An officer came to my school to get my statement and just told them what I saw that night. I slept in the living room for months after that. Hello, this happened a few months ago. Just to clarify, we live in a pretty good neighborhood. To show you how safe it is, or so we thought, a few days before this happened, my dad took me to my drumming lesson. We were gone for about an hour, and we came back home. We realized that we had left the key in the lock outside the whole time. No one took it, nor came in. This has happened before. But anyway, now on to the actual story. One night, at about 11pm, my mom and I were in the sitting room. My dad and sis were in bed. My mom was asleep on the couch, and I was playing PUBG Mobile. At one point, I could hear noises coming from the hallway. Thinking it was the cats, I brushed it off. I then started to hear more noise and thought, what the actual hell are they doing? Then I saw something roll on the floor by the dining room table and one of the cats walking up to it. Again, thinking it was the cats. The object, however, was placed on top of a vanity we have in the hallway. They don't go on top of that, but we do have a 9-10 to 10 month old curious kitten. Then I heard a male voice. At first I thought it might be one of my teammates in the game talking. I quickly realized it was not. I then thought my dad had gotten up, which is pretty common for him. So I asked my mom, didn't realize she was falling asleep, if my dad had come down and if it was him. She said, sleepingly, yes. So I try to brush it off again. Suddenly, I see this thing which I found out after were cleaning wipes for the interior of cars that were placed on the vanity. They were flying at me and landing on the floor on the stool in front of me. I don't remember quite well. I thought, that can't be the cats. So I got up and walked over to the hallway. I got to the step when I realized that my dad's walking stick and a straw hat that was on top of our coat hanger were on the floor. Neither cat has ever gotten on top of it. I then walked up the step and heard movement in the office. It was dark. The office is right next to the front door, about two meters from the living room and the front door itself. I thought it might be my sister looking for something. And then this guy gets up, comes out of the room, goes to the front door, unlocks it, and walks out. He was wearing a hoodie and I didn't see his face. Needless to say, I was paralyzed with fear and confusion. My mind immediately went to, do I know him? After he left, I yelled out to my mom that someone just walked out. She was obviously confused and concerned with that information I just revealed to her. We realized he came in from the back door, which was unlocked. He either climbed the gate, which is about two meters high, I think, or walked up the neighbor's stairs and then over the wall. You can see the back door from the street. The only things he took were the back door keys and a Bluetooth player, we believe, which we don't really care about. We made a barricade that would make noise if he came back, and we sat with knives and a big two-tooth fork until about 5 a.m. We had another lock, so Dad changed it the next day. Needless to say, I slept with a knife under my bed that night. Looking back, I wish I had done something. I played rugby for two years. I know the basics to tackle, but I couldn't move. Obviously because of fear, but my brain was also trying to understand what was happening. I probably could have taken him on. He was very thin and looked to be between 17 to 19, 20 at the most, judging by his style and body. We actually think we might know who did it, but they didn't break in. They only took two things, walked past all our valuables 
He didn't do anything to us either. It almost looked like he was trying to get my attention as well. Almost as if it was a bet and he tried to find a reason to get out. Either that or he's the worst robber I've ever heard of. I'm just happy my sister was in bed. It probably would have been a different story if she had been there with us. A lot of people think they know how they'd react in certain situations. I am living proof. You don't. I thought I'd scream at least, but nothing. We now lock our doors every night. Every time I hear a noise I get a little bit frightened, but I'm relatively okay. If he wanted to hurt me, he would have tried. Needless to say, we got lucky. TLDR Someone came into the house, and I came face to face with them when they walked out. I hope this was entertaining, if not eye-opening. Thanks for reading. Have a good night, or day, and stay safe. Hope everyone is okay. I've never told this story because it scared me so much, but now that I'm older and have experienced even more crazy stuff in my adult life, I figured I might as well share it. I was about 12 or 13 years old. I don't remember the exact age, but I was living with my father in his apartment, so it had to have been around that time. My father was at work, and I was in the living room eating the dinner that my dad had left for me in the fridge. I began hearing knocking sounds coming from down the hall in the apartment complex. Knocking, then a few moments of silence, and then footsteps. Almost as if someone was going door to door looking for someone or selling something. Eventually this person made their way to my door. I heard the knock, but didn't answer at first. My father told me to never let anybody inside when he wasn't home. However, I was a naive kid and thought this person might need help of some kind, so I opened the door. There was a middle-aged man in a brown sweater, medium-length gray hair, with a thick salt and pepper beard, relatively normal-looking, standing in my doorway. As soon as he saw me open the door, it was like his eyes lit up with excitement, in a twisted way of sorts. The conversation went something like this, paraphrasing to the best of my memory. Hey bud, is your mommy here? No, my mom doesn't live here. Oh, well, how about your daddy? No, he's working right now. Keep in mind, I was 13 and hadn't referred to my parents as mommy and daddy in quite some time, so that struck me as odd right away. But maybe I looked younger at the time. I don't know. Ah, I see. Well, maybe you can help me out with something real quick. My granddaughter lives here too, but I can't find her. Do you mind helping me look for her? Sorry, I'm not supposed to leave when my dad's not here, but I haven't seen anyone. He gave me an eerie look of disapproval and walked away without saying anything. I shrugged it off and locked the door, and then turned on the TV and sat down on the couch. About 20 minutes later, I heard someone jiggling the doorknob. I thought it was my dad, but then I remembered he wasn't supposed to be home for another couple of hours. Then I heard knocking and someone saying, Come on, let me in. It was the same man's voice. He continued to repeat himself, saying that if I helped him look for his granddaughter, he would buy me a toy or give me some money or buy me ice cream, and the tone of his voice became more and more aggressive. I was freaking out at this point. After a few minutes of this, one of my neighbors was entering the complex and saw what was happening, and he must have scared the guy off. All I heard was a bunch of, Who the hell are you? And get the hell out of here. I never told my dad about this, and I never saw that man again. I don't know who he was, or where he came from, or how he even got into the apartment complex to begin with. I was around 13 years old and at the shopping center with my parents. I wanted to go off on my own and wander around by myself for a while, and my parents agreed. After a little while, I was stopped by a woman in casual clothing. She told me that she was an undercover cop and I was suspected of shoplifting. Because I was young, I was, of course, terrified. I didn't ask her for ID or anything like that. I didn't know I could question authority. She asked to look through my bag and I let her, insisting I hadn't stolen anything. She asked me how old I was, who I was there with. Then she asked me something that still sends chills down my spine. Are your parents expecting you to go home with them tonight? I told her of course they were, why wouldn't they be? 
She then insisted I had to follow her to go and figure out this shoplifting thing. I went. She was leading me towards the exit, but by the grace of God, before we got there, we bumped into my dad. He asked what was going on, and I told him. As I was explaining the situation, the woman got on her phone and was talking to someone, saying things like, Oh, this isn't the right girl? And then hangs up and says, Sorry, wrong person, and abruptly walks off. My dad and I stood there dumbfounded. When my mom found out about the situation, she was really unimpressed by the way the undercover cop handled the situation. She took me to the center management the next day, and she complained to them about how I was treated by their undercover cop. And this is when the woman answered with, We don't employ undercover cops in this center. I have no idea what that woman had planned for me, but I thank my lucky stars every day that we ran into my dad. I was just driving home from a morning shift, and now was about a kilometer from home when this guy stepped onto the road in front of me, waving his arms and shouting, Stop! Stop! Please stop! I slammed on the brakes to avoid hitting him, and he ran to my window. I've had similar things happen before when people need help after an accident, and I assume that's what this was. I wound down the window, and this guy said, Please, please help me. I'm being attacked. Please get me out of here. And of course, me being the soft touch that I am, I said, Sure, mate. Get in. Now, I spend a lot of time in my car, and my front passenger seat is basically my office, and covered in crap, so not thinking... I told him to get in the back. This was lucky. The stranger is now in my back seat, and I said, Can I take you to a police station? What can I do? And he said, Yes, a police station, please. So I pull a U-turn and head to our nearest cop shop. Luckily, it's only about six kilometers away. At this point, I still think this guy has been legitimately mugged or something, and I ask, What's going on? There's people after me. There's one there, hiding in the bushes, and another one there, on that side of the road, up in the tree. There's obviously no one in either the bushes or the tree. Oh crap, I think to myself. I've picked up a person in the middle of a psychotic breakdown with a gang-stalking delusion. Okay, mate. Well, let's get you to the police station and get you sorted, I say, trying to sound reassuring and calming, and he seems responsive, then says, Thank you so much. Police station's just on the main road. It should only take us a minute to get there, I continued. I've never wanted a cop car to appear in my rearview mirror so much in my life. Only two kilometers to go. We drive in silence for about a minute, when he suddenly turns his head on the side, looks at me, and says in this super deep growl, You're not taking me to a police station, are you? I respond, Yeah, mate. Sure I am, we're almost there. Just hang on. He then says, You're one of them. This was the plan, wasn't it? I'm getting chased, and you just happen to show up at just the last second? Where are you taking me? Let me out. Let me out. And he starts thrashing around in the back seat, pounding the cushions with his fists and flailing wildly. Just then, we come around a curve, and there's the police station. No, mate, look. There's the police station. We're turning in right now. And we did. He then calmed down, said thank you, and ran inside as soon as I parked. I gave him a few minutes to tell his story to the cops, then went inside and told the desk sergeant what happened, just for context. So my sister called my family the other day and told my parents about a strange man that she and her friend came across. They had been there for about a week and were out walking in the redwoods when a man appeared out of practically nowhere and startled them. My sister claimed that he looked completely normal and was even kind of handsome, in her opinion, but he gave off a creepy vibe pretty quickly. He apparently began asking them weird questions, like who they were and what they were doing out in his woods. After they explained that they were just exploring, he quickly got annoyed and said they were liars. My sister and her friend began to walk away quickly, as they assumed he was probably on drugs, but he walked after them and said more weird stuff. 
She says he even asked them to kiss each other because, in his words, he said that they were lesbian lovers. Side note, they are not lovers in any way. My sister's friend apparently turned around and screamed at him to leave them alone. My sister said this is where he got scary as hell. She says he gave my sister and her friend the most evil and hateful look she's ever seen in her life, and he said this in response. You two are such disrespectful bitches. I've killed a few of you over the last few years, and I'd love to add you both to my count. My sister and her friend didn't even hesitate, and both booked it right after he said that. They heard him chasing after them and screaming at them. My sister says that she couldn't make out much of what he said, other than that he would chop them up and a few other threats. They both made it safely out of the woods and they didn't see him anywhere else. They got in their vehicle and sped back to town where they were staying in. They called the police to file a report and headed to another area and will be heading home soon. But needless to say, I'm scared and pissed off that there's some creep out there that did this to them. I, 20-year-old female, work part-time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. I'm a sales associate, so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. He was about mid-40s, and everything about him was odd, i.e. clothes didn't fit, expensive shoes, socially awkward. He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this though, he continued to ask questions, almost as if he wanted to keep my attention to him. He then asks if he can try out some more expensive items in the store, which is a massage chair, and I say yes. We let everyone try that massage chair out. At this point, I just thought he was an innocent yet socially awkward guy. He gets in the chair to try it out and continues to ask unusual questions. We chit chat for a bit and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it as well. All of a sudden, the questions got more personal. He asked what high school I went to and if I missed it, me being naive. I said the high school I went to and that I did not miss going. He said some story about a teacher I've never heard of and said he missed high school a lot. He asked if I lived around there, to which I avoided the question, but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the full price, along with her second most expensive item in the store. I thought he was fully interested, and I was convinced he was about to buy. We make commission on the chair, so I ignored his creepiness because I wanted to make the sale. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with a chair today and he has a truck that is big enough to hold it. It seemed I had finally answered his questions to his liking because I was able to walk away a bit. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately, and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, We got one. We got one. I had my suspicions that he was creepy, but now this just confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head no. He then stood up from the chair and said he will not be buying the chair today. Needless to say, I was so scared and felt alone. No one else around me but me and him. So I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife at the same time. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance slash exit. I didn't want to leave, but I couldn't stay inside the mall either. So I waited for him to go out of sight and then quickly locked the store doors and ran outside to my car. I then called my manager and said that I have to close this door properly, turn off the lights, count the register, etc. She told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did that. I was escorted back to the store to close up and was escorted back to my car with no further incident. By the way, I live in a city with one of the highest rates of human and sex trafficking in the country. Was I being targeted by a human trafficker? Not sure. Edit. 
I appreciate all the support and education on human trafficking and how they target their victims. When I wrote this post, I was not educated on this topic and this was the first thing that came to mind when I had this encounter. I realize now that this was most likely not human trafficking, but it's still scary, nonetheless. This happened about 15 years ago, so my buddies and I went fish camping at a pretty remote lake off of a 4x4 trail about 2 hours from home. There were 4 of us, all men, with me being the smallest at 195 pounds. This is important later. The camping spot has great fishing as it has a nice deep spot with lots of trout right next to it, but the campground itself is rough. It is on the side of a steep hill with barely enough room for tents and even a small fire ring. It is accessible by rough steep winding, 100 yard trail from where you park your 4x4 above the camp. We had a great day drinking beers and catching our limits on nice sized trout. After it got dark, we made a small fire and just BS the night away. It was a great time. Suddenly there was someone shining a blinding light in our eyes from about 10 to 20 yards away. We didn't hear this person approach at all. This person announced themselves as the sheriff. One of my friends asked, Are you a, insert our county's name here, sheriff? The stranger didn't respond to the question. Instead he shined a light in each of our faces and then said, Have a good night, then walked off. We sat there dumbfounded asking each other what the hell was that. After a minute or two, curiosity eventually got the better of me. So I lit up this person with my stupidly powerful flashlight. He was about 50 to 60 yards away at this point, right before a crest and bend on the trail, which is right before he was out of sight. We all saw it. It was just some dude in a flannel shirt and jeans. I said, that is not a sheriff. He must have heard me as you could see him start moving quickly for a second before finally he went out of sight. A few moments later, we heard an engine start. And that was that. It is strange that we didn't hear the vehicle earlier, but I attribute that to being drunk and loud. Now what makes this kind of scary is what if it wasn't for four big dudes he approached? What if it was a single person or a couple? What would he intend to do? Should we have chased after this person? Debatable. Should we have reported this to the actual sheriff's department? Absolutely. But sadly, we never did. So this morning, I've literally just started my delivery round, as I was arriving at the very first school I deliver to. It's a village next to a big road, kind of on a mountain, and to get to the school, you have to drive all the way to the top of the village, taking various streets. Then the school itself is a bit offset from the road, but there's a few houses around, however, on the very spot I stopped my truck to make my delivery, there's just the school on one side, and on the other side there's a few meters of large grass band, followed by a parking lot. At this specific spot there's absolutely no light, since the public lights are off until 5am, and I'm here around 4am every morning. My only way to get some light to get to the door where I need to deliver the meals is to let the engine in my truck run, so I can light up the wall of the school with my headlights. Everything else around me is literally pitch black. So I do my delivery, come back out, close the back door of my truck, and I realize I have to take a piss, so I stop by the grass that's just against my truck to do it before hopping back in and leaving. As I said, it's pitch black. I'm literally facing darkness, and I can't see crap in front of me, except for the lights of the city that's about 10 miles away downhill. I'm chilling here while peeing, Look at the sky because there's no clouds, and since there's no public lights I can see the stars pretty good. Then as I'm finishing, I put my head back down to my normal line of sight, with the lights of the city downhill in front of me. I see a silhouette passing in front of it. I can just see the shape of a head and shoulders passing by, a few meters in front of me in the darkness, and I only see it because of the city that's far away. At this moment I was done and closing my belt to get back in my truck and I kind of like instantly freaked out, so I started walking alongside my truck to get back in. I was behind the truck peeing, not close to the driver's door, and I'm thinking to myself, 
Nah man, that wasn't real. You didn't just see a head and shoulders, just some branches and leaves. But I wasn't buying it at all. I was sure of what I saw, and I was freaking out. But here's the worst part. Once I'm back in my truck, ready to leave, clutching in to get into first gear, I take a look to my left rear view mirror as I'm starting to slowly put my truck in motion, and there, I see a figure behind my truck, peeking to check in on me as I just got back into the truck. It confirmed I didn't imagine it. There was someone here, at 4am, in the complete darkness. Pitch black darkness, walking here for whatever reason, and just a few meters in front of me. Also, they could clearly see me because I remember I left the headlights on to light up the wall, so I'm watching pitch black darkness, but they can see me very clearly. Plus, the engine is running next to me, so I can't hear if they would make little noises when walking around. And this person followed me at the back of my truck and peeked at me for whatever reason. I got so freaked out, and I still am. I'm not delivering to this school for two weeks because it's winter holidays here in France, but I'm genuinely scared to go back there. I might be 1.90 centimeters, 6 foot 3, 105 kilograms, 230 pounds, and a dude. But this is scary as hell. How could you even hope to defend yourself against someone who wants to attack you if they can clearly see you and you don't? Then you're at a disadvantage. I think this is the right sub for this. It only happened a couple of days ago, and I really feel like I want to tell people because I'm still scared. My husband works a rotating schedule, so sometimes he works night shifts, and other times he works days. Two days ago he started his night shift rotation. I always feel uneasy at home when he's not here, even though we live in the country and it's supposed to be safer out here. Around 9.30 Friday night, I was doing my dishes, my daughter was watching TV and my dogs were sleeping. I just turned the sink off and I heard our screen door open. It makes a swoosh kind of noise when it opens and closes. We have a little entryway between the screen door and the main door. A couple of seconds after I heard the screen door, I saw the main door handle turn all the way down. It has an electronic keyboard lock so the handle turns even when it's locked. I feel so lucky that I remembered to lock it. Immediately the dogs start acting weird. They're running to all the windows trying to look out and they're constantly growling and barking. As much as I didn't want to, I looked out the window and saw nothing. No person. No car. Nothing. So I picked up my daughter and took her to the bedroom and called 911. It only took a few minutes for cops to get here because I guess they were just in the area. I told them about what happened and they looked around briefly and told me the wind opened the screen door and nobody was out there. Whatever, I live in the woods. The person was probably standing a hundred feet away watching them half-ass their search. I haven't felt safe here since. I've even started locking the screen door. It's not like the house looked empty. All the lights were on and the TV was playing a show. I can't even describe the deep down fear I felt when I saw the door handle turn. I'm glad the dogs are very vocal and scary sounding. I think it deterred the person from trying any harder to get into my house. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now, I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Madu Saltil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, 
then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen, that's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.